Hello and welcome back. Today we're going to talk about how to read maps um, in both 2D and 3D versions. Maps are basic tools of geography. They enable us to depict spatial phenomenon on paper. And there are conventions used in cartography, which is making maps, which allow a map to be read efficiently and quickly. A good map will have a legend or a key which will show the user what different symbols mean. For instance, a square with a flag on top usually represents a school, and roads are represented by a variety of widths and combinations of lines. Often a dashed line represents a border. Please note, however, that map symbols used in the United States are often used for different things in other countries, so make sure that you read the legend if you're reading a map from another area. The symbol for a secondary highway on a USGS topographic map, for example, is equivalent to a railroad in Switzerland. Without a north arrow, it is difficult to determine the orientation of a map. With a north arrow pointing in the correct direction, a user can determine direction of where they are, where they're going, and where other interesting locations may be. Some maps, such as topographic maps, will point to true north, which is the North Pole, and then to the magnetic north, where your compass points, which is northern Canada. Usually you won't see something quite as detailed as a compass rose, like you see here on this picture, but, you, uh, but a map does need to provide orientation, and usually you'll see at least an arrow with an N pointing on it. A neat line is a border on a map. It helps to define the edge of the map area and obviously keeps things looking neat. Since the map is a flat representation of the curved surface of the Earth, all maps are inherently inaccurate. There are a variety of projections which have been formulated for different uses, and we've talked about those in previous lectures. A map's title provides important clues about the cartographer's intention and goals. You can hope to expect entirely different information on a map titled Unemployment in Jefferson County versus Topography of Mount St. Helens. So in this case, we're actually looking at bicycle and pedestrian facilities. It's not a road map. We're more concerned about the people getting around in other ways other than using cars. Color appears so often on maps that we often take it for granted that mountains are brown and rivers are blue. Just as there are many types of color maps, there are also many different types of color schemes used by cartographers. The map user should look to a legend to, for an explanation of the colors on the map. Please don't make assumptions. Our expectations of colors on a map lead to some problems when it's used for elevation. Elevation is often represented as a sequence of dark greens for low elevation or even below sea level, to browns, which are hills, to white or gray, which are the highest elevations. Since many people associate green with a fertile region, many map users will see the lower elevations, which may be deserts, and assume that those areas are filled with lush vegetation. Also, people may see the reds and browns of mountains and assume that they are barren, Grand Canyon-type landscapes of desolation, but the mountains may be forested and covered in brush. Additionally, as water always appears light, bright blue on a map, the user is often inclined to visualize any water on a map as pristine and clear blue, even though it might be an entirely different color due to pollution or other factors. So, for one thing, we're going to practice with maps. We talked about the development of longitude and latitude, and that is our most common coordinate used systems for the Cartesian coordinate system. So what I would like you to do is I would like you to take a moment, pause this lecture, and write down the approximate uh, longitude and latitude uh, locations for each of these cities. So I want you to do Pyongyang, Seoul, Busan, Tokyo, Osaka, Xiamen, Hong Kong, and Keelung in Shanghai. So go ahead and pause the lecture, and when you're ready, come back. If you would like to check your answers with me, feel free to do so by email or during office hours. Okay, now that we're back, we're going to talk about fields. 
Fields are a region of space in which a similar quantity can be measured at every point or location. So depending on what type of field you're looking at, uh, the nature can change. For example, while measuring the temperature of a room at various locations, you would probably find the temperature is high near the heaters and low near the walls and windows. But this is still a type of field, temperature fields. Other field quantities can include the strength of gravity, the magnetic field of the earth, and the elevations of the land. Physical quantities can be measured and described by the size, which is the magnitude, and sometimes by its direction. If the measured quantity has a magnitude but no direction, it is called a scalar quantity. For example, the speed of a car measures 88 kilometers per hour. This speed is a measurement that has no direction associated with it, so speed is a scalar quantity. Examples of scalar quantities include temperature, relative humidity, and atmospheric pressure. If the measured quantity, however, has both magnitude, or size, and direction, it is a vector quantity. For example, you're driving 88 kilometers per hour from LA to San Francisco. Not only are you traveling at a particular speed, but you're traveling 88 kilometers per hour north. It has both magnitude and direction, therefore it's a vector. Examples of vector fields include magnetism, gravity, and wind velocity. Field maps are models on which scalar or vector quantities are plotted. To show varying values of either scalar or vector quantities within a field, isolines may be drawn. Isolines connect points of equal value on a map. Types of isolines include isotherms, which you see here in this picture, isobars, which is at atmospheric temperature, and you see them on weather maps, and contour lines, which you see on, top on topographic maps. Isotherms connect points of equal temperature. Isobars connect points of equal air pressure. And contour lines connect points of equal elevation. So this one obviously is not a contour line, but you can see the points of elevation. And what you're going to do is you would connect the dots, basically, to make isolines. And generally, you do it in quantities of either tens or fives or twos, depending on the variability that you have in the altitudes. A topographic or contour map shows the shape of the Earth's surface. The measured heights may be shown as numbers on the contour map. Contour lines, which are isolines, drawn on the map give exact elevations, or heights above sea level, for a region and show the shape of the land. Each contour line is separated by the next by a uniform distance and elevation known as the contour interval. In other words, the contour interval is the difference in height between adjacent contour lines. Where the contour lines are close, the steep of the ground is steep. Where the contour lines are far apart, the slope is, of the ground is gentle. So if you take a look at this particular contour map and you try and figure out what the interval is, the contour interval between the lines on the map, you take a look and you go, okay, well, every hundred is marked. And if you look at the 100 to the 200, there's four lines between them. So that means five total contour intervals between them. So 100 divided by five is 20. So the interval between contour lines on this map is 20 feet or meters. It does not specify. A topographic map represents three dimensions, length, width, and height, or elevation and altitude. For example, a zero contour line shows the shape of the land at sea level, which would be like coastlines. The single contour is two-dimensional. A series of contours builds up to the third dimension, which can be shown in a profile. A profile is a side view of the elevations along a particular line, the baseline that crosses contour lines on a topographic map. So the process to create a profile from a topographic map is as follows. First, you draw a baseline across the contours of the topographic map, and that's been done for you at A to B. At the point where the baseline intersects a contour, mark the elevation of the contour on your graph. You project a vertical line up from each elevation on the line on the profile shown on the map, and then you just join the elevated points to make the profile. On the right side is a side view of hilly terrain. 
On the left are a set of contours, but the two don't match. Try to fit the map view from the left with the proper profile on the right. For example, number one is associated with profile B. So take a moment, pause your lecture, and take a look at each one of those for two through six and try and match it up with the correct ones. If you would like to check your answers, feel free to email me or see me during office hours and I will be happy to assist you. Now that you're back from your pause, you can determine the rate of change of a value within a field by measuring the gradient. Gradient, or average slope, is the rate of change in field values at two points with the distance between those points. If the distance between point A and B on this map is 6 miles, what is the gradient between those points? So first you take the difference in elevation between points A and B. A is 114 feet and B is 117 feet, and the difference is 3 feet. You take the difference and divide it by the number of miles between the two points. So that is 3 feet divided by 6 miles. So the gradient is 0.5 feet per mile. Okay, that concludes the lecture on how to read 2D and 3D maps. Feel free to ask me any questions during office hours, and have a great day.